having a plan is is so valuable but you have a plan so you know when to deviate from that plan and if i have somebody that's on a set program more often than not that program and if i design it is going to have high intensity days moderate intensity days and then recovery or low intensity days from on it this is total human optimization a show about inspiring peak performance through a combination of unique experts and actionable information. On today's show, we talk with the Director of Fitness Education of the Onnit Academy, John Wolf, about maintaining strength for life. So John, you wrote a really great program for us for our New Year's Resolution Series. It's called the 12-Week Fat Loss Program. And when we talked about putting it together, we both we're in agreement that we wanted it to be not only physique focused to give people great body composition results, but we also wanted it to reflect on its values, total human optimization, uh, giving them longevity, giving them stability, strength, joint health, all these things that people tend to look past when they're just trying to put on muscle and, and gain strength. So can you talk a little bit about how you work those aspects into the program for a more you know holistic approach? Yeah, definitely. So up to this point, we've released the, the first four-week training cycle. And uh, a lot of what we put into that were some of the more fundamental strength training principles that we'd like to introduce to you know, the general populace. And, and if we were to look at what more people out there you know, the need in terms of general physical preparation, uh, what they lack and what they need, what their lifestyle is like, you really see, you know, some commonality there you know the shoulders generally don't work uh they don't have uh they have a shortened front line of their body and people are in a seated posture even here at our office we have a very health conscious environment but we're all knowledge workers and our our society is moved in that direction so we wanted to make sure we did some we introduced some strength training that would help to bring awareness to counter that right so uh, when we looked at say the deadlift and instead of thinking about deadlifting off the ground which puts people in a position where they're more than likely going to be up against the the mobility limitations we wanted to reduce the the range of motion requirements so we went with a uh, rdl off of some pins uh, make sure making sure people stay within their functional movement capacity right um, so all the strength training components were either focused on really reinforcing that hinge pattern deadlifting or opening the front of the body which is we, we just mentioned hey most people are in the seated posture where they're flexed all the time so just starting this process of creating this balance between the front and the back of the body and then uh like you said mobility mobility is such a big part of the equation with everything we do at the Onnit academy because most people just don't take into account the health and integrity of their joints and connective tissues but unfortunately um that's really what dictates how old you feel and how well you feel ready to take on whatever challenges you have in life. So we try to keep a simple, direct approach to incorporating some joint mobility and even the conditioning circuits that we we threw into the mix. We added some rotary variables to make sure that uh, if if you couldn't do it, do it yet, you're working towards developing the ability to to twist and turn. Uh, so as time goes on, when you build up all that work, uh, the last component of the, of the equation is is to make sure you kind of pay pay it forward to your body and decompress. And we just try to keep it as simple as possible, but still pretty comprehensive in that first four weeks. And, and we'll do more of that over the next couple phases as well. While strength is an obvious priority of elite athletes, does its focus demand attention from even the common gym goer? I think, you know, People think of strength as kind of like a master quality. That's been a popular theme recently. And and one of the things that for us, we really, um, at the Onnit Academy and at Onnit, we're always looking to highlight what what are best practices. And so we agree that strength is a prerequisite to live a, a fulfilling life, to have a high quality of life, and to be able to, to, to tackle whatever obstacles life puts in front of you and overcome them. How much strength do you need? Well, that that is when we start to think about um, what an individual might need, right? So ideally, when we start looking at 
developing strength or a strength training program, we want to look at what it is that that individual might need to overcome the obstacles in their life. And it's all relative, right? So, you know, if, if you have somebody who values traditional strength training, uh, you know, picking up the maximum amount of weight off the ground or bench pressing it, you know, how much you bench, bro. That's kind of that old mentality, right? Uh, a lot of times what we look at strength training is the ability to dictate, maintain, or, or consciously move through various different ranges under your control, whether you're using external load or not. And, and I think that, you know, as, as the industry moves forward, we can continue to define a more comprehensive view of what strength training is and, and bring that to the masses. I mean, I think as an industry, we obviously see that there are a lot of people who understand strength training is more than just picking stuff up and putting it down in progressively higher loads. But, uh, you know, as we get to have this wonderful platform right on it, we also get to educate people that may still feel that way. What about people that automatically lump in the bodybuilding aspect of everything into strength training? They think that strength training is bodybuilding and vice versa. That's really the function of just different phases of consumer awareness, right? So if you look at pictures of the 1800s, the type of people who did to perform strength training or strength feats are, are, are old time strongmen, Arthur Saxon. They're doing stuff that you see much more commonly practiced now than you would have in the 60s, 70s, uh, Nautilus and bodybuilding eras. Um, and so now what you see is it's, it's kind of interesting how what's old is new again. Um, bodybuilding is strength training, but it's strength training for a very specific purpose to make muscles grow. Right. And, and, I think that, again, qualifying or basically having a better understanding of what you're strength training for is, is part of this process, right? So if you want to get big, you strength train like a bodybuilder. If you want to get strong and you measure strength in terms of moving bigger weights off the ground or in various different positions, you probably train a lot more like a power lifter. If you want to be strong and you practice martial arts, you probably do a lot of multi-planar strength work and maybe use some unconventional tools like you see here at the academy being proliferated pretty often. Uh, strength is just such a broad term. It's such, such a one, it's one word that can mean so much. And so, uh, you know, it's an exciting time in the industry now where uh, consumers and trainers and professionals, uh, we have such a a diverse offering of strength training opportunities that uh, you know, people can find what they're looking for. And uh, sometimes people can find what they're not looking for. And that's something we, we definitely find a lot. We, we cater to people who want to come into the gym or practice uh, a functional aesthetics type of program. Like, you know, I want to be big and look good naked. That's pretty common, you know? And then we, we have the opportunity and kind of the obligation to give them, in addition to what they want, things that they need like the mobility and the, the multiplanar strength stuff that we like to introduce, um, concepts that we like to introduce. It's a, it's a really exciting time to be able to kind of create your own recipe to, to give everybody the best of all those worlds. You mentioned mobility and that it's a huge part of this program. I think now that most people go into gyms, they're familiar with foam rollers and they have an idea of what some mobility exercises they can do are. They're kind of lost in the wilderness now they they know it's important but they don't really know where to begin with it if you could distill down for us a couple of mobility drills that you think give us the most i hate to use the cliche bang for the buck but but let's just say that what would they be like give me something for the major uh you know joints in the body sure sean um first i think defining mobility a little bit more uh, a little better than what common understanding is is probably one of the prerequisites to really understand what mobility is. So uh, a friend of mine and somebody we value very highly what they contribute in terms of knowledge uh, in this realm in mobility, uh, he would use the term functional mobility. So it's not about the extensibility of the tissues themselves. So it's not just stretching or it's not just mashing tissues into submission, which we've seen a lot more of in, on the consumer side of things and in, in commonplace in gyms uh, with foam rollers and all these different tools that they utilize to kind of have a short-term change in the quality of the tissues. But also uh, the ability, or, or primarily, the ability for you to actively move your body through 
progressively larger ranges of motion. Uh, not purely for the sake of more is better, but to understand how your joints and tissues are designed to work through a functional range of motion. So yeah, there's so many different drills. It, some of the things that we find are extremely effective uh, are, uh, let's just use two major examples, the shoulders. Uh, so many people experience uh, called trap dominance. They're like really bound up and they feel a, a residual amount of tension constantly between the base of their, their jawline right underneath the ear down to the tip of their shoulder, their traps. And this is a, a common issue for a lot of people. Back to the desk working society we are, uh, this trap dominance kind of causes tension headaches and other discomfort. And it's really sometimes the most simple tool is the most effective. So doing uh, overhead arm circles uh, in high repetition, we use that as a, a simple way to allow people to understand how the mobility training impacts the structure, particularly with the upper body this way. So you fatigue those traps out with these overhead arm circles, uh, maybe like 20 sets of 20 in each direction uh, with both arms, and then you bring the arms down and all of a sudden, that person has so much more range to laterally flex their neck and they have less tension there. And, and that kind of translates into a lot of other potentials. It might help them press heavier weights. It might just help them not be in pain. Um, the other one, so shoulders is one big area. Hips, hips are a big thing. And a lot of times, uh, if, you're, if your hamstrings are really tight, that's gonna limit your hip range of motion and, and your hip flexion uh, to be able to get into that and control your spinal position. But a lot of times what people don't realize is hip rotation. Uh, so uh, bring it back to, uh, our friend Andre Ospina, he teaches something called a 90-90 position. And we teach a modified version of that to make it more accessible called a shin box. But any of these drills where one hip is externally rotated open and the other one's internally rotated, you start to see that there's a big disparity in the way your hips function in one way versus the other in these different configurations. And, and then there's a, a whole plethora of drills that you can access from this position um, to help you move better, and of course, if your hips work better, the neighboring joints tend to be happier. And those are low back and the knees, which I don't know if you, you know anybody, but I, I've heard a couple people complain about low back and knee issues over the last, well, any week that I've ever heard anybody talk about how their body feels. So um, it's just amazing, a simple tool like this, even maybe even sitting in that posture without thinking about doing anything else and, and working on being aware simply being aware of where you are and how you move or how you don't can have such a profound impact on your overall, your body's health and function. Yeah, now you, you bookend the workouts. There's mobility in the beginning and then at the end there's uh, decompression. Can you talk about how decompression varies from a mobility warm up and what the goal is with that? Sure, it, in the Onnit Academy system, when, whenever we're teaching any of our methods or tools, so whether you're learning uh, kettlebells, maces, clubs, or even barbells or dumbbells, we're always going to prep the body with a general warm up, And, and we might not have to have a ton of time to do this, but generally a minimum 10 minutes of going joint by joint through the major joint complexes and moving them through full ranges of motion to prep the joints for the work to come. And, and in that we get to have the coaches and the individual become more aware of what's moving and not moving well that day because every day is different. So it's kind of like that. I always liken it to the dialogue of when I get home from work, I ask my wife how, how her day was. And then I listen. And so when you move your body and move your joints through these ranges of motion, that's your goal. It's like, how are you doing? And then listen. And this gives us the opportunity to, to know whether or not some of the things in the workout need to be modified, regressed, or, or completely taken out based on whether or not it's safe for that individual. After that, we, we go into a second phase of this warm-up where it's very specific. So we know what drills we want to do. So we want to prime the, the tissues around those joints to be active in the way that we would predict would benefit this person. So in the example of a squat, we might do a 90-90 or a shin box. Make sure that they have rotary stability and rotary control in the hips really be able to help protect the spine and the knees from taking any additional work um, in a squat. And then, so where all that goes into funneling into some type of 
holistic or performance goal in the workout. Decompression on the other bookend is, is really about understanding that exercise, no matter how well designed or how good of a program, there's no magic program, there's no magic exercise that doesn't abide by the same rule, which is the said principle, specific adaptation to impose demands. So whatever you're doing for exercise, you're measuring it in the intended outcome. Unfortunately, the reality is it's stress to your nervous system, your musculoskeletal system. And if you don't have absolutely perfect technique, which nobody does, um, you're also getting an unwanted structural adaptation. So no matter how good you are, no matter how perfect of an exercise it is or a program it is, you're getting positive adaptation and you're getting potentially negative adaptations as well. So what we, we need to be able to do is say, well, hey, what is it we're biasing the body into in terms of positions? And can we, as soon as possible after we loaded up the body, unload the body in those very specific ranges? So we introduce postures that are opposite of what we load. So again, using the squat as an example, you're pulling yourself down into this very flexed state at the hips. And so the hips get loaded very heavily in this position. It might be a good idea within your decompression session to extend those hips, get those tissues to get to full length, or even exaggerate that to counter all of what you've done in the work and get your body to a point of greater balance to get right back to life and have less negative impact from training. Now, when it comes to strength training, how does age play a role? John Wolf has some thoughts on that. You know, it, it's really interesting it's not necessarily always their actual chronological age, but people have a training age as well. So we use this term to understand how long somebody's been in the training game with, if they've been in exercise and fitness for a long time, or if they haven't. And what's really interesting to take note is the more repetitions people have done and think that they know what they're doing, the harder it is to undo the negative impact of their previous training. Um, so you have this perfectly clean slate with this young athlete that's never trained. The potential is so great to instill a positive relationship with movement and exercise is part of a movement lens, right? Exercise is just part of the, the equation. It's not everything. And, and in a positive relationship with how they look at their body as it performs all these things. And, and that's really what we try to do for people who've been in the game longer or that are older. It's just that more often than not, we look at ourselves as a, this kind of duality, right? Like my brain is the, my consciousness and my body is this slave. Essentially, it bid, does my brain's bidding, my consciousness bidding. And, and unfortunately, we, we fail to realize a lot of times that um, the consciousness, the brain, the, the analytical part of our body that wills us to do all these things, we... We, we don't realize it. it's just this mean tyrant. And then we speak to our body. We, we, you know, I don't know if you've ever done this Orlando, but I certainly have, you, you know, you dumb shoulder. How come you're not doing what I want you to do? Or uh, you play soccer, my, you dumb knee, you keep me from playing the thing I enjoy. Right. And so the reality of the situation is it's like investing in a positive relationship, a positive interaction with your body on a daily basis no matter what age you are and no matter what training age you are, where you are in your athletic pursuits and endeavors is one of the primary things that we want to do. So what's, what's really odd, you say different ages, but we all see like different levels. So, uh, of being sedentary or active. So what's really funny to realize is the high level athlete that's training really hard and is at the peak of their physical capacity to do, the one thing they might do in sport. And then the sedentary person who's been on a couch for 20, 30, 40 years, they manifest almost the same needs. You know, they're, they're beat up for different reasons. One, because they didn't move. One, because they moved too much in a very specific way. And it's, it's just, it's really enlightening to see this very broad audience that all just basically needs more, a more conscious practice of movement and a more healthy relationship with the vehicle they call their body. In today's world, everybody's looking for the quick fix. John reminds us that trainers and programs are not always miracle workers. Yeah, I mean, this is a great topic. You know, when, when it comes to uh, understanding, recognizing, 
and then fixing. Okay, so this is just, just this is this is great because this is common terminology. Uh, you know, when we, we talk about the consumers that come in and have, they're looking for something. This is something that a lot of people are looking for, the solution just like this. And the reality of the situation is fixing things is above a trainer's pay grade. So what we have to as an industry is understand what we do. We facilitate a positive uh, environment, we facilitate a positive interaction with this person's body that can get, that can that they can adapt to in a, in a predictable and positive way. So yeah, we, we want to acknowledge through a lot of the assessment processes, daily ongoing assessment of hey, how are you moving today? Um, and then seeing how the body responds. Are they breathing? Are they holding their breath and, and tensing up? And if so, that's a good indication. Like something's going on with what, what we're trying to move. And becoming sensitive to that as a coach helps the person become more aware of it. In that process, man, it's amazing. Just what awareness does, right? Consciousness does. We talk about consciousness all the time around here at, at the office and as a part of our, our total human optimization approach. But as a trainer, just becoming aware and being empathetic through that process, my goal is just to say, this is where you're able to move without pain. So we're going to train in that range. And what happens is through that practice and through the positive experience with movement that that person has, I don't fix anything. But there is a change in that person's body. And that change likely will allow them to live with less pain. They're exhibiting, they're exhibiting less pain as they have more positive experiences with similar movements. And, and secondarily, you know, it's not a bad thing if moving forward, their body, because that's really what it is, their body's responding to just a movement stimulus and their body heals itself, right? So as trainers, I think there's a lot of times people in the industry that feel like they fix things. The reality is it's, it's not their job and they don't really have the capability, but if they do their job well, if they create this framework of success and safety and the ability for people to move well, repetitively so they can adapt, it's amazing that that person's body fixes itself, right? And so uh, I know that's just a reframe of the original question, but I think it's so important to understand uh, we are not clinicians, we are not ther therapists in that way. Uh, we're just facilitators and guides, and we wanna keep our people safe and have them able to explore what may or may not be the catalyst for them to heal themselves. You made a great point about being able to change things about a workout on the fly, depending on how you're moving that day. So for example, uh, you want to go in and do heavy back squats. That's what your program calls for. But you find out during your mobility warm up that your, your knees just don't feel right or your hips are tight. What's an example of how you could modify that to get the same basic training effects, still hit your legs hard, but not do any further damage or risk injury? You know, that's a great, that's a great scenario. I think that that happens more often than not, right? And and then in this in this case, what what you said is well, it's it's heavy leg day or heavy squat day. So what we we'll see is we're talking about somebody that has a set program, and I think programming is so awesome. Having a plan is is so valuable, but you have a plan so you know when to deviate from that plan, and. If I have somebody that's on a set program, more often than not, that program, and if I design it, is gonna have high intensity days, moderate intensity days, and then recovery or low intensity days. And what may be the best case scenario in, in terms of making sure this person is gonna feel better sooner rather than later, wouldn't necessarily be to hit the legs hard that day, but to add a new recovery day and continue this training cycle as prescribed from that day forward, even if you go recovery day, recovery day, because your body's telling you that you're, we overshot the loads, we overshot the volume, we undershot the recovery time. So rather than say, I'm very fixated in my understanding of what my goal is today, if I'm programmed, I have an understanding of what my long-term goal is. So whether or not I feel a little emotionally defeated, what we need to do 
as an individual, if you're doing it for yourself or as a coach is look at where we may have overshot. Is it volume? Is it load? Is it movement progression? Am I, am I out of position? Um, it, it, that's why having a coach is so valuable because, Hey, I can't see what I'm doing. Uh, I feel what I'm, what I, what I'm doing in my body, but man, an extra set of eyes that I trust and somebody who can be honest with me, you know, pull me back when I need to and, and push me to go harder when I need to as well is so valuable. So, uh, you know, I, myself, uh, if, if left to my own devices, and I think a lot of people would do exactly what you said, just figure out a way to kind of cut a corner and still get a hard workout in. Um, you can put a lot of effort into making sure your joints are moving well and, and, and maybe doing some PNF stretches. So you're, you're getting some muscular effort while you're still prepping the body to perform at a higher level the next day or the day after. And that's, to be honest, one of the easiest ways to get the best outcomes short and long term, I would say is don't feel like you have to throttle up just because it says so on the piece of paper. Uh, the piece of paper is not dynamic. It's not organic. It's not biological. It's just a guesstimate and you have to take notes and make, make, uh, decisions on the, on the, on the journey, right? It's like kind of like taking a roadmap and you don't know that there's a detour, but you see a yellow sign. Do you keep driving forward through the yellow sign or do you turn right? Like it says, Hey man, you got to be able to make those adjustments on the fly. Um, and, and not feel bad about it. You know, that's the key. That's the hard part, actually. The emotional attachment. I don't want you to have to give a cookie cutter answer, but just, you know, as a scenario, if you're going to squat heavy and that doesn't feel right, could you, would you do some like, you know, landmine squat or goblet squat? If like this, like just try to find another squatting movement that's just going to be less injurious? Yeah, definitely. So there's a lot of different strategies. Um, and you hit a couple, right? Say a landmine squat is so great because it forces you into a position. Say you said knees, right? So if your knees are bothering you, um, we teach a lot of strength training with a, a the knees tracking forward of the toes. And, and that's great so long as your knees are healthy enough to be able to take that load in this range, right? So, hey, we changed the the type of squat we're going to do. So now we go more of an ass back squat or a low bar or powerlifting back squat. Uh, we set up a box. We test and see if we can work through progressively ranges, deeper ranges of motion from high to low. We change the tool. So the tool in terms of a landmine changes the angle of approach, what forces you to sit back and reduces the amount of freedom of movement that you ex ex exhibit, right? So you no longer have as much lateral instability if you have a barbell on you or you're not stuck in a position where your shoulders have to be externally rotated and attached to something, uh, you can change to a kettlebell. We can do body weight for intervals, man. There's just so many variables that you have access to. Some people, uh, you know, might not ever think about just changing your stance, going to one and a half or like a kickstand, uh, uh, going to a split squat stance. We, if somebody is working with me and they, um, and we have a lot of freedom, or if we are compressed on time and we need to get a training response, like mandatory, they have an athletic event or something else going on, uh, we need to develop strength and we have a short timeline. I'm going to exhaust all those resources if it's just one structural issue. If it's an overall systemic fatigue issue, then we're going to go recovery day. If not, man. We're going to change all these variables and see how the body responds and work where we can safely to get the best response possible. You mentioned earlier that uh, use the Romanian deadlift instead of the, the conventional deadlift from the floor, which I think is a great substitution for a lot of people. It's easier on the lower back, a little more uh, user friendly. You also, you pair that with a pullover, which you use to train the back. I think a lot of people think of the pullover is kind of an antiquated exercise. It was, it used to have a reputation for chest expansion. But I love it because it, it can help you train the lats without aggravating the elbows, which uh, chin-ups tend to do over a while, uh, over the course of a, a period of time, which you know, a lot of people love to do chin-ups and pull-ups. So can you talk about that exercise, maybe some of the other ones in this program that people might be surprised by? Yeah, I mean, a lot of thought tends to go into what can look very simple on paper, right? And so the pullover, uh, and this actually comes from, in terms of, it being brought back to light for me in terms of a, a dumbbell pullover on a bench. Uh, 
came from a shoot that that you and I did not too long ago, and uh, you were coaching me through uh, and making sure I did a straight arm version for the same reason that you're just mentioning, right? So again, always taking notes from other coaches in, that I have access to and other perspectives and integrating those into my philosophy as well on the fly. It's something I think is is underrated by most people in, in, in today's age right now. They fixate on one thing, right? But in the case of what we used it for in this program, it was really great because, yeah, you start to prepare an understanding of how when we stretch these lats and we go into this overhead position, what's the first thing that gets sacrificed, right? All of a sudden that lower back comes right off the bench. The ribs are flared up. We lose structural integrity. So as we start coaching people to keep that nice neutral spine, pelvis neutrally aligned and keeping that low back on the bench, moving through this range of motion, you start having people become very aware of what lack of range or lack of strength through that range they might have. And we gradually get them to open up over a course of four weeks to be able to, um, if anybody's gone through that program for four weeks and you get to the fourth week and you're doing your pullovers, you will have noticed if you do them correctly, a huge change in the comfort level and the ability to get this overhead position, which we may be using in upcoming, in upcoming uh, cycles of training here as a prerequisite to do things like you said, pull-ups, chin-ups. What was the other drill that kind of mimicked this? The second strength training program, we paired a bent over row with a pull-up bar hang. So a lot of people have extremely weak hands. So this is a great way to train the hands, but guess what? You also are passively using your body weight hanging off this, this bar to open up this very similar range as well. And, and it's just amazing what people lack in these foundational strength, you know, strength requirements, essentially. Can you hold this position? and they want to load up their body with tons of weight. And so this is, again, this is just a foundational four week training cycle. It's not meant to train everything and get the type of uh, physique change in that first four weeks. It's just to set a foundation so that we can be a little more aggressive as we move forward. Hey, thanks for listening to the show this week. If you want to listen to past episodes or make sure you get the latest as they are released, take a moment to subscribe on iTunes. Also, do us a favor and leave a review while you're there. If you have a question, please contact us on Twitter at Onnit, O-N-N-I-T. And make sure to check out Onnit.com for the latest in supplements, functional foods, and equipment. This episode was co-hosted by Sean Heisen. I'm Orlando Rios, and you've been listening to Total Human Optimization.